Father, it's in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, the one that we have such confidence in, in the one that came, in the promised Messiah, in the seed of Abraham. This morning as I stand here and as we stand here, we have no confidence in our flesh. We have all confidence this morning in Jesus, in your word and in your promises. But we found them to be true and found you that you are true and that you are our God. This morning, Lord, we have such tremendous hope in you and all that you are and all that you've done for us. And so I bless you this morning. I bless you this morning for who you are, for the grace that is in you, for the grace that has come to us through Jesus Christ. This morning, Lord, we stand here in your grace. Lord, I pray this morning that now as I open the word and as we look at your word, which is eternal and everlasting and does not change and is sure, more sure than anything else that we have here, it is completely sure. So I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that breathes in us and on us and inspires us and has inspired this word. Just so many things to thank you for. Thank you for the blood. The blood that has washed away our sins and that the price has been paid. That nothing more is required. But that the blood is sufficient. So thank you for that. Lord, I pray this morning that as I share what's on my heart this morning, that there would be something that remains, something that stays, something that is more than good thoughts, but that you would somehow move our hearts to a greater degree of faith and love. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning that the Lord has laid on my heart is the call of the believer. The call of the believer. I say believer and I trust that most of us, if not all of us in here, are believers this morning. See, a believer is more than someone that acknowledges that Jesus, that there was a man named Jesus. A believer is more than that. Probably, I wouldn't hate to put a percentage on it, but many, many people, if you walk down the street or if you ask, and if you ask them um, about Jesus, they would say, yes, we believe that he came. However, they have not entrusted their hearts to the Lord. And that's the difference between one who is a believer and one who is simply an acknowledger. One who has entrusted their life and thrown their life into the hands of an almighty God and has put their faith in Jesus Christ. A believer, one who believes. This morning the title of my message is The Call of the Believers. We are believers, ones who have met the Savior and who the Savior has met. Believers, ones in whom the Lord has made a difference and has changed our lives. One of the reasons that I want to preach this, or the Lord has put this message on my heart this morning, is because I believe that there are times, at least, that we go through, maybe individually in our lives, and maybe even more corporately as a as a group. But at least times that we go through, where maybe our vision is not as bright as at other times. In uh, in the Old Testament, I'm not sure exactly which book it is is in, but uh, it's a verse that's very familiar. One of the prophets said like this. He said, "Where there is no vision." their people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. It's a very familiar verse. And I like to put it in a little different paraphrase maybe. Where there is no sight of the glory of God and the purpose of God and the call of God. Where there's no vision. If you take this word where it says the people perish, and you look it up in the Hebrew, the meaning of that word is they cast off all restraint. They cast off all restraint. Where there is no vision, where there is no sight, where people are blind, there people cast off restraint 
because they have no understanding of the glory of God. We don't have to look very far into society around us, into America, to understand that the majority of people are living in a way that's blind. They have no vision. Oh, they can see with their eyes when they're, they're not physically blind, but they have no vision of the kingdom of God. They have no understanding of something that's greater than who they are. They have no vision. That's what this means by vision. It's not talking, of course, as you know, it's not talking about physical eyesight. It's talking about something that's spiritual. Where there is no spiritual vision. People cast off restraint. That's why people cast off restraint. They have no understanding of a holy God. They have no fear of God. And today I'm going to tell you that if there is no restraint in your life, we can bring laws today here as a church. We can bring rules and regulations. We can tell you and put condemnation on you. But that's not going to restrain you. Organizations try that. We try it even on ourselves to bring condemnations, to bring rules. But it's only the vision of who God is in His glory that brings restraint into somebody's life. A fear of God. A fear of God. Where there is no vision, people perish. They throw off restraint. How are we to live in this world that we live in? How are we to act? How are we to walk? Does it make no difference how we live and how we walk? I say that, as you know, I'm a pretty honest person. Sometimes when I preach, I, uh, I say things that later I wonder, why did I say? But, uh, you know, sometimes there's a controversy. Some people say, Anything at all that, is a, that, that would seem like restraint on a person's life or anything that, where you would come and say, hey, that's really, that's not good. So, well, that's legalism, that's law. How should we then live in this world as Christians? Is everything okay? That's kind of what my message is about this morning. The call of the believer. On the other hand, you have those that again try to put restrictions and very tight and very everything's clamped down and you can't do anything. That doesn't work either. We see that. That causes problems. So that's not the answer either. I want to look at, starting out here, the call. I want to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 22. going to talk a little bit about the call. We talk about callings. In the Bible, as I began to study this, I was quite surprised at how, many, how often the Bible uses the word call and callings. And I'm not sure, that's one of the reasons I'm going to, to talk about this a little bit, is do we understand what a calling is? Because I think we have a certain understanding of it, and at times it can mean one thing, at times another thing. I want to look at that a little bit. So I'm going to look at chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 22. And it's talking about a king, and it's talking about marriage. I'll read, starting in verse 2. Jesus speaking in a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. 
But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both good, or both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. I'm going, to, I'm going to stop there, but after that, the Pharisees, something that they were, they were not happy with what he had said, and they tried to tangle him in his, in, his, in his talk and so on. But they were not happy with what Jesus said, because I believe part of this parable of what Jesus was relating here, of how a king made a marriage for his son, is the ones that were originally bidden never showed up. I don't know, but I think it could have been referring to the Jewish people. As Jesus came to the Jewish people and they rejected him. And so they didn't show up. The king, the, 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 the ruler of the kingdom, made this marriage for his son, got everything ready, and he sent out the invitations. He said, Come, I have a marriage ready, I have a feast ready. I want you to be part of this, I want you to enjoy this. Come and be part of this celebration. And people were too busy to come. One had a farm, one had a store, and had merchandise. And so some of the others took his servants and they treated them wrong. And so finally the king said to his servants, he said, you know what? They're not going to come. Go out into the streets. Just go out into the, go out into the city. Find the ones that are out there that are, that are says some bad and some good. So just go out and find people. Bring them here so that we can celebrate the marriage of my son. And so they did. Some bad and some good. They brought him in to that marriage. It says the servants went out into the highways and gathered them together, all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. I think we're among the bad and the good. We're among the bad and the good. We're invited to a wedding. Some of us may have been raised and tried all our best in all of our ways to be absolutely as good as we could be. Some of us didn't matter. I was raised in a good home. I was, I was raised in a church setting. But I'll tell you that my heart was absolutely and desperately wicked. Matt already talked about it this morning, how desperately wicked my, that our, our hearts are. Some people, they absolutely are raised. They want to be absolutely good. But even in that, there is corruption. I wasn't that way. I had a heart that was bent on evil. I was bent on wrong. And somehow the Lord in His mercy came down and He changed my life. Because there's an invitation. And so the bad and the good are invited to that wedding. But I'll tell you that one of the things that every one of them needs as they come into this wedding, now in the, in this, in the, in the, in the culture that was back here, when someone came to a wedding, one of the things that the, one, that the king would do when he invited these people to the wedding is as they came in, he would give them a wedding garment. He was the one that supplied them with the wedding garment. That was one of the things that they had in their culture as they came. That as they came in, they would say, okay, here's something that you need to put on. You need to wear this if you're going to be part of this wedding. Here's a garment for you. Somehow there was a man that got into this wedding that didn't wear a wedding garment. He had his own clothes on. And when the king saw him, he said, what's this man doing here? 
How did you get in here not having a wedding garment? And it says the man was absolutely speechless. He didn't know what to say. And the king said, take him and throw him out. I want to talk about a call. And as I speak about this, I recognize, like I said before, there's callings of God. Paul said he's called to be an apostle. But there is an overarching call that has gone out and continues to go out from the kingdom of God. And when I talk about call, what, it's, what I'm talking about here is an invitation that has gone out. This king got a wedding ready for his son. And there was a call that went out. There was an invitation that his servants took out. And he went out to those that he wanted to come, and some of them ignored it. And so the invitation went out to others, the bad and the good. We're part of that group. We've heard that call. We heard a call. An invitation to a wedding that's going to be, that is still being prepared. That's what call means. Call is an invitation to be part of something that's bigger than what you are. To be part of something that is an eternal plan that doesn't just begin with you and it won't end with you. Have you heard the call? Have you heard the call? And one of the things that this king provided was a wedding garment. We've heard the call. We've heard a call. We've heard something that's moved our hearts. Something that's bigger than what we are. It's the kingdom of God. It's what he has prepared for us. But there's a robe that he also has. My, my message this morning isn't about a robe of righteousness and what he supplies. It's just part of this passage here. But I'll tell you, there's no way to get into the wedding wearing your own garments. There's garments that are provided by the king. There's garments that are provided and they're, and they're perfect and they're pure. And it's a robe of righteousness that is provided by Jesus Christ. But I wanna, what I want to talk about is a little bit about this word call. A call has gone out. And you see, if I go back to the book of Genesis, right after man fell, after they fell away from the glory of God and the presence of God, they were no longer experiencing the presence of God and they were hiding, hiding among the trees because they were ashamed. And as they were there hiding, God came walking through the garden in the cool of the day and he was looking and as, as he was looking, he was looking for fellowship. And as he was walking there, there was a word that went out from him. And he said, Adam, where are you? Where did you go? Adam, where are you? And he was searching and he was calling. And you see, I hear an invitation in that. I hear an invitation. In Isaiah chapter 51, there's a word that says, uh, 55 it is, Isaiah chapter 55 we, if we would turn there, I'm not going to, but if we would, it, would, it says like this here, Come ye to the waters, every one of you that's thirsty, come, buy bread, buy wine that has no price, that you can't pay for. We go a little further to the New Testament, and Jesus says in Matthew, I think it's chapter 11, he says, Come, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come. Here's my point with this. There's a call from God. There's a call. He's calling. It's the heart of God. He's calling. And I believe it happened right after man, already right after man fell. It's the heart of God to bring people back to himself. There's a call, there's an invitation. And it's got a lot of many, and it's got a lot of different aspects to it. One of them is a call to the sinner who is deep in sin, who has never experienced the goodness of God. There's a call that goes out. Come! 
Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest from that burden and guilt of sin. Come. It's the call of God. It's the voice of God. Always in the voice of God. Until one day that will come to an end. There's an invitation. There's a call to come. There's a call to come to have experienced freedom from the burden and the guilt of sin. There's a call to come to find rest for your soul. Jesus says, come and learn who I am. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. As I was thinking about this, meditating on it, I had to honestly say that there's times that there's some kind of a yoke that I haven't always felt to be easy and light. And I wonder if that's the way you feel about it too. Sometimes things seem hard and not so easy. And what I find is that when I start doing things on my own, See, Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so if I have a yoke on me that seems hard and heavy and burdensome, then it must not be the yoke of Jesus. Maybe it's a yoke of religion or some other yoke that I've put on myself or I've allowed to be put on myself or something else. Maybe it's a yoke of law or legalism. But I'll tell you this, that the yoke of Jesus, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. That is the truth of Christ. And if I'm finding it in some other way, then it's some other yoke or I'm not being yoked with Christ. There's rest with Him. Not striving, but rest. And it's one of the calls of Christ is to come and to be yoked with Him. To walk with Him in a yoke and to learn of who He is. To learn Him. Not only not to learn about Him, but to learn of Him. To learn of His nature, of who He is. I'll talk about that a little bit more as I get down to the end of the message. All the way from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Let me read another verse here in Revelation chapter 22. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. From the beginning to the end of this book, there's many, many more places where the word says, Come. It says, Come. Come unto me. If you're laboring, if you're heavy laden, Jesus says, learn what rest is in him. And learn of him and learn of who he is. There's a call going out, an invitation. I'm going to go through a list here. Just, I, I just picked some things out. And I'm going to go through this. And I'm just going to, these are different things in the scripture. For, so it talks about being called, invited, called. Called to be saints. This is an invitation. As I go through this list, I want you to think of this. This is an invitation from God. Say, come and be part of this. Called to be saints, sanctified ones, ones that are set apart, pure and holy. Saints of God. People who have a call on their life. An invitation. Called to be saints. 
It's a little hard for us sometimes. I was going to go through this list, now I'm talking about this. Are you called to be a saint? So we want to stumble over that a little bit. I'm called to be a saint. I'm invited to be a saint. To be one who is set apart from the world, one who is set apart from evil, one who is set apart from wickedness, one who is called to be holy. You're called. Call unto the fellowship of Jesus, called into the grace of Christ. You're called unto liberty. You're called unto the kingdom and glory. You're called with a holy call, calling, not according to our works, but his purpose and his grace. He called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. He's called us unto glory and virtue, which is excellence of character. Called to be sons and daughters of God. Well, as I said before, I understand also, Paul said, I'm called to be an apostle, and that there's individual callings and um, gifts, gifts and callings that God puts on individual people. But overall, over all of that, there is a call of God that He invites us into to be part of His kingdom, to be part of His realm and rulership. And that's what my message is about this morning. I think our vision sometimes gets quite low of what God has really called us to. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, You are a chosen so, uh, generation, a royal kingly priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. The word peculiar means a prized possession. We are a possession that is prized. Tremendously prized. We're a, royal and a, and we're a royal and a kingly priesthood. We've been selected, a selected generation called to show forth the praise of the one that has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want to talk a little bit about light and walking. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness... We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. One of the things that this verse makes clear is this, that the place that the blood cleanses is in the light. The blood cleanses in the light. This has been a number of years ago. As I was, it's been quite a number of years ago. I had a, I had a, I don't know, if it wasn't a vision, but it was something the Lord showed me as I was meditating. That the whole world lies in darkness. The sinners lie in darkness. That's why they do what they do. They haven't seen the light. All they see is what is around them. And they stumble. And I, as I was, I was meditating, I was worshiping the Lord. And I, 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 I saw this picture of light coming from God, shining on us as individuals. And it shows us. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. The word shows us. The Holy Spirit shows us as we're, as we're open to him. He begins to shine on our life. And I remember that time when that light, first of all, began to shine on my life and I saw who I was. Have you seen that? But I saw that this light shines us, the light of the Holy Spirit and the light of Scripture shines on us. And it shows us corruption. It shows us sin. It shows us things in our life. And then we have a choice. You have a choice. I have a choice. Sometimes because that light shows us who we are and it seems like it's so hard to deal with, we have a choice and we turn and we choose to put our back to that light. And then we begin to walk in darkness and we stumble because of the, that light. We, we think we can't deal with it. 
But I'll tell you where the blood cleanses is when we walk in the light, when we are honest with our condition, when we're honest with our brother, when we're honest with our sister, when we're honest with our wife, when we're honest with our husband, and we say, this is who I am. And we allow the light to shine. We don't hide. That's where the blood cleanses. And if we're not willing to deal with the things God shows us, and we turn, and then we begin to walk in darkness because we've turned away from the light. I understand Brother Wayne had a message about children of light. I haven't listened to it, but it's while we were gone. We are called to be children of light. Children of people of transparency. People who have light and bear light. In the Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, 19, it says, The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. But the way of wickedness is as darkness, and they know not at what they stumble. And this is one of the things that I see as I go about my work and my daily tasks and things that I do. And as I deal with people, I, I see people who are stumbling, and they, they don't understand why they stumble. They don't understand what they're stumbling at. It's a mystery to them. Why does this always happen in my life, they say? Why do these things happen to me? Why is my marriage broken? And I see this and I hear this. They stumble and they walk in darkness. Jesus said he didn't come to condemn the world. We're not here to condemn either. We're here to bear the light. To be bearers of truth and light. To be bearers of hope. To be bearers of righteousness. But it's not a self-righteousness, but it's a righteousness of Christ. That's who we're called to be. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. It says here in Proverbs that the path of the just is, as a, is a, it's a path that shines brighter and brighter and brighter as we go on and on and on. As we walk in the light and as we allow the light to deal with us. It's one of the points I want to make. People, you're called to be bearers of the light. A light that shines a light that shows, a light that carries love. The darker it is around us, the brighter this light will shine. The blood cleanses when we walk in the light. I want to look now at a verse in John chapter 8, Gospel of John chapter 8. I want to talk a little bit about freedom. John chapter 8. John was talking, or Jesus was speaking to the, some of the Jewish people. I'm not sure it was the Pharisees. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word... Then are you my, my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him and said, we, We're Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Stop there. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus is the truth, and there is a spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will guide us into all truth. When we have him in our life, when he's the Lord of our life, he guides us into all truth, and he shows us. And Jesus said that we'll know the truth. The truth is more than just fact. It's the reality of Christ. And that that truth will make us free. 
It will give us liberty. I think there's a misunderstanding, a shallow understanding, maybe I should say that, a shallow understanding of freedom, of the freedom that truth gives us, of the liberty that is in Christ. I think later it talks about it in the epistles. It's not a freedom to walk in the flesh. I think sometimes there's a very shallow, maybe, interpretation of this that we have, that now we are free and we no longer have to wear a certain kind of clothes or do a certain thing or look a certain way. Friends, that may be true, but there is a freedom here that Jesus is talking about that is much, much, much deeper than that. It's a freedom of the spiritual man. It's a freedom to be free of the self-life. Three freedoms, at least three freedoms here that I see. He came to set us free from the burden of the guilt of sin, which I've already talked to you about. That burden and guilt that we carried so many years and drug along and that hung behind us. That condemnation and that guilt. He came to free you from that. And if you're carrying it along today, if there's a burden and a guilt of sin that you have today, I am telling you that Jesus, the good news is, He came to free you from that burden of sin. He came to free you from the power of sin. See, Jesus told him right here, He said, He that is the servant of sin, he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. That's why people sin. They're servants of the, they're, they're, they're slaves. He came to free you from that, my friend. He came to free you from sin itself, from, from the power of sin. You don't have to sin any longer. And he came to free you from the old nature, the selfish nature that demands its own way, demands this or it demands that, or is easily hurt. Or is so sensitive that it can't function. He came to free you from that. And he came to free us from the fear of death. You see, what is a slave? A slave is someone, if we take a look at the children of Israel in the land of Egypt, what is a slave? A slave is someone who is not allowed to make his own choices. This is what's sin. This is the tyranny of sin, and it's the tyranny of the self-life. It's someone who always has to listen, as the, as the children of Israel did, and when they were under the bondage in Egypt, the slave master told them when to get up. He told them what to do. He told them how fast to do it, how long to do it. And they had no choice in it. That's a slave. That is what sin is. It's a master over us. Unless we bring ourselves under the lordship of another, under the lordship of the Son Himself, under the lordship of who He is, the King and the Priest of love. We will serve one or we will serve the other. I'm coming down to something here that I, that I want to talk about a little bit. And it's this, it's the power to choose. Joshua was at a place. He led the children of Israel to a place, and he said like this in Joshua chapter 24. He said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing, cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. God has given us a free will. He's given us a will. And it is with our will that we choose. God put man in the Garden of Eden, and there he put two trees, as you know, as you very well know. He put a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he put a tree of life. 
And he gave Adam and he gave Eve there, he gave them the power to choose. They could choose any of the trees of the garden, it says, except there, this is one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat of that tree. Don't take of that tree. Because surely if you do, you will die. And as you know very well, Eve took of the tree and then she gave to Adam. And they made a choice. Eve was deceived, the Bible says, but Adam made a choice. When his wife came with the fruit, the serpent tricked Eve, deceived her into thinking that if she takes of this fruit, that she will become like God, that she will be able to know good and evil and to direct her own life. See, this all was about depending on God or being self-dependent. And so she took, she was deceived, she thought it was the right way, look good, and she took. And then she gave to her, her husband, Adam. The way I understand it there, Adam was not deceived. He knew what God said. He knew that God said, don't take of this tree. But he wanted to please the woman. Maybe he didn't want conflict. And he made a choice. And he took. And in that, subjected all of mankind under the dominion of sin, under the dominion of disobedience, under the, dis under the dominion of self-life. You see, we talk about sins, and then we talk about sin. Sins come from sin. From the desire to rule our own life. To have no one else tell us what to do. But it is only as we surrender and as we bring ourselves under the authority of the Word of God, under God Himself in Jesus Christ and the, and the Holy Spirit, you will either serve self or you will serve God. One or the other. But God has given us this ability to choose. You can be under your own authority or under the authority of God. The call of the believer. You wonder why am I, why am I saying this? Well, I want to take a look at Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus said like this. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus said, I'm giving up my life. There's no man forcing me to, to do this. Yes, they're going to come and put me on a cross. Yes, they're going to crucify me, but I'm, take, I'm laying down my life. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. So this commandment have I received of my Father. You see, when Jesus was in that garden, and when he was looking into that cup, and he was seeing there the sins of the world, and the diseases of the world, and the sicknesses of the world, and the depravity of the world, and it says there, and as he, as, he, as he sweated great drops of blood, and as he was looking into that cup, he spoke these words, and he said, Oh, Father, if there would be some other way, isn't there some other way, if there's some other way to do this, then let this cup pass away from me. Then let it go from me. But if there's no other way, then he said like this, if there's no other way, then your will be done, not my will. And as Jesus was struggling there, or as he was praying in the garden, maybe she, and as he, was, as he was praying there, there was something that was going on. What was it? Jesus had a will of his own. He had a will, he had a desire. It's very clear there, he said, not my will, 
If there'd be some way, his will would have been if there would be some other way for this to be accomplished without going through the pain of the cross and the pain of suffering and all the horrors that went into it that go way beyond even physical suffering, Jesus said, if there would be some other way, Father, what was he facing? He was facing the cross. He was facing laying down his own will and receiving the will of the Father. And he took the cup. And he took the will of the Father. And we know now the other side of the cross. We know the resurrection. We know that he got up again. We know that he didn't stay in the grave. But what he was facing was a long, dark valley of death. Of laying down his own life. Of taking up a cross. Of laying down his own will. To do the will of the Father. And the other side of that is a glorious and tremendous victory. As the Holy Spirit came down into that tomb and raised him up out of that tomb. And as we, as, as we know the other side of, of what happened. And he lives today at the right hand of the Father. They're interceding for us. Because he drank a cup. Because he made a choice. Because he chose the will of the Father. That life was not taken from him. He said, I give it. I give it. As we surrender our lives to Christ, he will not force you. He does not force. He calls. And he says, come, share my cross, share my yoke. You and I have a will as well as Jesus had a will of his own. I want to talk a little bit about something here. As we walk in Christ, Christ gives us freedom. See, I started out with this by talking about freedom. Freedom. We can walk through our life constantly blaming circumstances, other people, things that we can't control for our problems. We can say, in fact, the world is full of this. I am the way that I am because so-and-so did this to me. And they live in bondage to things of the past that have happened. Maybe the bondage of unforgiveness or the bondage of bitterness. But the power that God has given us is a power to choose. And he later wrote about him. And this is one of the things that he said. He said, forces beyond your control 
can take everything that you possess. This is what happened to them in the concentration camps. It can take everything you possess except one thing. Your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation or your circumstances. You cannot control what happens in your life, but you can always choose what, how you will respond and how you will feel about it. Now that might seem like a, a big mouthful. That is what he learned. And he spoke of people that in the midst of their poverty, in the midst of their humiliation, there were men that walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. Everything can be taken, but the one thing, the power to choose one's response and attitude, to choose faith, which works by love, to choose the cross and to choose love, to choose to believe who Jesus is, to choose to believe the Scripture and to trust. Everything can be taken from you. Circumstances around you can be pounding on you and me. People can be unkind to you. They can say bad things about us. And you have a choice. You have a choice. I have a choice. Which nature will I walk in? Will I take the yoke of Christ? Or will I demand my own way? My own comfort? Will I demand that no one ever says anything bad about me? Is that the only way I can function? Will I demand that my life is always full of comfort? Will I demand that everything I do, that somebody says thank you? Will I demand that I will always be noticed? Will I demand from my wife that she never irritates me in any way? And takes care of my every need? You see, there is a lie that says that we cannot choose. As we surrender to Christ, to the Word, to the Holy Spirit, see, the world says we are who we are. We can't change. The power to change comes by the way of repentance and the cross. And if you are willing to be yoked with Christ, take the cross on yourself. That means that we have to bear things that we don't like. That's forbearance. That means what I'm talking about is putting on the nature of Christ, putting Him on, embracing His cross, embracing the will of God for my life. We talk about the will of God and we're thinking about, Lord, when are you going to send me to Africa? When are you going to send me far away? When are you going to give me a big ministry? The will of God is to be walked out in day-to-day -day shoe leather. As we walk in our jobs, as we walk in our homes, as we walk wherever we go, Bear the will of God. What will you choose? Do you even consider the will of God? Do I consider the will of God? Am I concerned about the will of God? Do I care what He says? And what He wants? It's only by the cross. It's only by the embrace of the losing of my own life and the finding of his. This man, Viktor Frankl, learned something in this concentration camp. 
He learned that mankind can take everything you have. But you can choose your response. I can choose my response. And in the midst of trouble and in the midst of trial and in the midst of persecution, we can have joy. We can have life. And purpose and meaning. Don't take the lie that what other people do has to control your inner life. Because it doesn't. It will affect you. It will hurt. But it does not have to control your response. That's freedom. Are there other freedoms? Yes, there are. But it is the freedom to enjoy and to walk in the nature of Christ. Freedom from the tyranny and the rule of the self-life that wants to control us. Are you concerned about the will of God? Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Jesus wants fruitfulness out of our life. Fruit is something that grows. It's not something that comes by effort. I was, I was challenged as I looked at this. It's a very familiar scripture to me and I've preached about it more than once. The fruit of the Spirit that comes from our life comes from intimacy. It comes from knowing Jesus and knowing who He is, spending time with Him. And if we're troubled, if we see things coming out of our lives we don't like, Maybe it's time that we have a little more intimacy with, with Jesus. A little more time with Him. That's how fruit comes. You see, to have intimacy, there has to be openness and there has to be honesty. If you want to be intimate and have fellowship, there has to be an openness and an honesty and a trust. And that's where we find intimacy. Intimacy. Jesus said, abide in me. If my words abide in you, and ye abide in me, ye shall bring forth much fruit. And ye can ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And this is simply a question that right now I'm asking myself. Where is the fruitfulness of my life? Busyness wants to come in and steal things away. Discouragement wants to come in and steal things away. Disappointment wants to come in and steal things away. But it is through intimacy and time spent with the Lord that fruitfulness comes. Not by lots of activity, but by intimacy. Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Solomon searched for meaning. He tried a lot of different things. He came, as you know, he came to the end of his life and he said, it's all vanity, it's all vexation. I've tried a lot of different things. I've built palaces. I've tried the wine. I've tried the women. I've tried it all. And I come to the end of my life, here Solomon was, he said, you know, it's all vanity and it's all vexation. What's the point? What is the point? And that's, I think, where a lot of people find themselves after filling themselves with all kinds of things of the world. I particularly thought of this as we had a funeral and as, as Brother Sam was here in the casket, his body was here in the casket. I thought of this. Here's the end of a life. He's gone now. My father-in-law passed away in August. And I remember when my wife called me, I was, I was working somewhere. I was up on a roof somewhere trying to fix something. And she called me and she, she said that dad passed away. And I remember how it affected me. It's like, what's the point? What's the point of being on this roof? What's the point of going to work tomorrow? What's the point of making effort? 
That's where Solomon was. He said, I'm doing all of this and then I'm going to die and somebody else gets it. And really his question was, what's the meaning and the purpose of life? And he came down to the end there and he said, he said, it's to fear God and to keep his commandments. And Isaiah, it says, everyone that is called by my name, I have created them for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. We know, I'm going to paraphrase this, verse is a familiar verse. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. If the worship team wants to come up, I, I'm going to be closing very shortly here. If you want to come up and get ready to maybe sing a song or two. This is a very familiar verse here, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. But I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit as I read it here. First of all, I'll read the verse and then I'll, I'll read a little paraphrase. But we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now I'll read it in a paraphrase. We are aware that the whole thing, or all thing cooperates, actually works for us, for our benefit. Talking about things that happen around us, circumstances. We are aware that all of those things cooperate and work together for us, for our benefit, to them that love or are a friend to Yahweh. And to them who are called or invited into his purposes and into his plan. That to those who have thrown themselves into the hands of Yahweh, into the hands of the Lord, who love him and know him as a friend, as Abraham knew him as a friend, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, if you walk in what I have told you, you are my friends. You're not just servants, but now you're my friends. Because a friend shares things deep from the heart. When you have friends, you can talk. When you have friends, you can open up your heart. And you can say, well, this is what I really feel like. This is really who I am. That's a friend. And the friend responds and gives you his heart. You see, I believe this. I believe that there are people who are saved. They know the washing of the blood. They know what it is to be free from the burden of sin. But maybe they don't know God as a friend. Do you know him as a friend? Do you know him as one whom you share your heart with? And he shares his secrets with you? Not only as a servant. Jesus again said to his disciples, he said, the servant just, he just does what he's told. But a friend, a friend hears from the heart. And there's a sharing that goes on. Where does this come from? Where it says here, we're called according to his purpose. Purpose is the same word as the word that is used for showbread. So I'll talk a few moments about showbread, and then I'm going to bring this to a close. Showbread. Showbread was, as you, if, when you went into the tabernacle, the first thing that you came to as you went in, I believe on the right-hand side, there was a little table that was made out of acacia wood, and it was covered with gold. And it was called the table of showbread. And it was also called um, the bread of the presence that was on there or continual bread, or the bread of the face. And that bread, there always had to be in the tabernacle, there always had to be bread put there. Every week it was made fresh. Every Sabbath day, there was fresh bread that was placed on that table. Twelve loaves, six, uh, two stacks, six each. There was, there was twelve loaves of bread representing the twelve tribes of Israel. And that bread had to continually be there as a sign of fellowship before the Lord. 
But the way that that bread was made is they would take the flour and they would beat it very, very fine and they would make so that there was no individual grain that could be known in the way that flour is made and then they would mix it. It was unleavened bread. There was no yeast in it. And they would make that bread and then they would bake it and then it would be put fresh there again every Sabbath day. And it was a type of fellowship with the Lord. We break bread with Him. He breaks bread with us. But it's also a type of the will of man. Is what that is a type of. Fellowship, my friends, only comes as we're willing to lay down our own will and receive the will of God. And God takes us through processes to make that happen in us. Our will becomes beaten very fine as we surrender to Him over and over again. You see, you and I have a will. We have the way that we want things, as Jesus also did, as I showed you in the, in the garden. His natural being didn't love the idea of going to the cross. But his spiritual man, who he was in the inside, embraced the will of God. We think we have to feel like we like something before we do it. That's the selfish man. That's the old man wanting to be comfortable. You just need to give up your will and receive the will of God. And sometimes it looks hard, sometimes it looks dark, but the other side of that is always sweet fellowship with God. It's the table of showbread. It's where we find intimacy with Him as we walk in Him and walk in His way and in His will. A continual laying down. You see that that bread had to be made fresh every week. And what I, this, is, this is one of the things that I've found. I would like to come to a place where I lay down my will and now it's done. And now it's over. And I'll never struggle with it again. I never have to face that again. It's continual bread. That's one of the things it was called. It was called continual bread. And in this life, there will always be a call for the believer to be laying down that will and receiving the will of God in Christ Jesus, of knowing His will and walking in it, the embrace of the cross. We will never have a place in this life where that is over. Every week it was made fresh, and those grains were ground down to very fine, and it was late before the Lord. Just know that, that the walk of a Christian, of, a, of, of one who wants to know the heart of the Lord, is a heart of brokenness. It's a heart of being made into bread. Where the shell is crushed and broken. And that is something that doesn't just happen once. It happens over and over and over again. I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer and then talk about that just for a little bit and then, then I'll, I'll be at the end. Our Father which art in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus came to earth. Heaven came to earth. We pray the Lord's Prayer. We're asking that the will of God will be done in the earth the way it is in heaven. How will that be done? How will the will of God be done here in the earth? It will be done by people who believe. See, we want something kind of mysterious, something far off to happen. But for the will of God to be in the earth, it comes through believers. The call of the believer. 
You see, I see this. I see that sometimes it seems like in America, Christianity has become about being against abortion. It's become about being a conservative. It's become about standing for certain principles. Maybe against gay marriage. Those are all things that are wrong. You can be against all of those things and miss the call of God. The call of God in our life as believers is not just to be good people. It is to bring heaven to earth as we walk. It is to bring the glory of God where we're at, wherever we are. That there's light, that there's glory, that there's presence, that there's flame. That there's something that walks with us that's not from earth. It's the divine nature of Jesus. You can have all those other. You can stand for being against abortion. I'm not against that. Of course, obviously not. But our call is much greater than that. It's to bear the image of Christ wherever we go. That people are touched by something they've never met before or someone they've never met before by the love of God. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. We're not here for that either. We're here to bear and carry his image. And to do that, it must be only by through the cross and the giving up of our own will. That's a continual thing. It's our call. It's a glorious call. It's a wonderful call. And you can walk in that call no matter where you're at or where you work or what you do. We're called for that. All right, I'm going to close with that.